and we've got some phenomenal uh, speakers with us today. And I just want to say thank you very much to them for taking time out uh, to spend time with us. And just to introduce the speakers individually, um, Dr. Carla Ett, apart from wearing the coolest glasses at the conference. <laughs> Um, she's a Director of Futures at UCL Institute of Education. She's a pioneer of digital publishing and product development and has worked in international digital learning space for over 15 years. Mr. Philip Schmidt is Director of the Media Lab Learning Initiative. His work spans technology-enabled learning systems. He's a leader in, in digital credential systems and also a co-founder and board member of Peer-to-Peer -Peer University, which provides access to online higher education. Shankar Marwada is the CEO and co-founder of XStep. Shankar is an entrepreneur and marketing professional whose experience includes large-scale projects such as India's National Identification Program. We have Justine Cassell, is an associate, uh, Dean of Technology Strategy and Impact at Carnegie Mellon University, as well as Director Emerit Emerita of Human Computer Interaction Institute. Justine co-directs CMU's Simon Initiative on technology-enhanced learning and was previously at Northwestern and MIT Media Lab. Hannah Dudic is a teacher and a finalist for the 2017 Global Teacher Prize. Rania Hadi is the head of Google for education for the Middle East and North Africa. She has been with Google since 2003 and has held several roles in the organization. Uh, just to give you an update on how this process will run, uh, each of the speakers is going to speak to about between six to eight minutes. And after that, I'm going to open up to questions and uh, questions uh, to the floor, so I can get as much conversation as possible. All right. And up first, I would love um, Carla Etz, please, to get going. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all. Um, I had a bit of a problem, kind of working out what to do in this session. So for about a week, I was thinking I'm going to do something about data and data in education. That'd be really cool. And then last night, I thought, you know what? I'm going to tell you a story about my local rural school and a project that we did and actually how the lack of technology enhanced that project. And, but it's also very much about the future because it's all about the kids in the school. So I'm a governor for a local primary rural school with 40 kids spread over two classes. So you've got the really little ones who still suck their thumb and, cu and curl their hair uh, up to year three and then you've got the rest of the school in another class. So you've got um, a big age spread in two different groups. And one of the challenges that the school threw at me was like, okay, you're a governor and you work in education and technology. Can you please come and do a STEM day? And it's like, oh my word, a STEM day. Um, but basically I did two half STEM days, one in each class. But I kind of took a bit of a STEAM approach rather than just a STEM approach. And what we did with both classes in slightly different forms was, first of all, the spaghetti marshmallow thing. Does anybody know this thing? Okay, so we did the spaghetti marshmallow thing, and for the tiny ones, I got straws because they don't break so easily. So we, had for, we do forest school in that school as well, which is like every Friday afternoon the kids have a field around the back of the school where we go and dig the Nile and build pyramids and do all sorts of projects. So we had had a project around the pyramids and the Nile a few weeks before, which I also happened to be at. So with the little ones, I said, remember the pyramids we made and how dirty we all got? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So can you now make the pyramids with marshmallows and straws or, or, um, or spaghetti? Oh, yeah, 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 great. So they, and I made them do it collaboratively. So it was all about solving the problem together. And they came up with the weirdest pyramids I've ever seen in my life, but they were absolutely amazing. And um, one of the bigger kids with his friend, he kind of made this connection of connected pyramids that sort of took the whole back of the classroom. He couldn't take it home, it was too big. So that was great, and that was, they had to tell us then how they built the pyramid. The next thing we did with them was, okay, now you've got to kind of go and build, actually no, not build, you're gonna draw a robot. These are kids, you know, from two and a half, to about seven or eight uh, drawing robots. And they had to draw them together. That bit didn't quite work as well with all of them as I had anticipated. But they drew the most amazing robots. And so then they had to come and tell the whole class what their robot was doing. So I'll give you one example of a little boy 
who actually finds it quite hard to speak, but he drew the most amazing robot. And what he'd done was, lots of, you know, it was quite humanoid, and did lots of little buttons on its belly, and it was, he obviously does karate. And what he, what he wanted to do was, like, have a karate robot that could teach him better karate. So the robot would show him the move, he would press a button, he would then video what he'd been doing, upload it to YouTube, watch what he'd been doing, watch what the robot was doing, and sort of do it all over again. So, you know, a nice little ecosystem, an edtech ecosystem that this little lad had designed for himself. Absolutely amazing. So the next morning I moved to the bigger class, we do the spaghetti test only, and we build a tower. So they have to get the highest tower. Now one of the, one small group, they were actually really clever, and I kind of had to tell them, you can't really do that. They felt that it was constantly falling over. So what they did was they put the tower on the ground and put a bit of tape around it to <laughs> stick it to the table, and suddenly they had the highest uh, tower in the classroom. So that was the kind of the manual test. And I then gave them a, um, a task to work in groups. I printed out little sheets of paper with the shape of an iPad screen. And I said, can you please design together an app that will help you learn, or will help you kind of read, or will help you do something that you feel is beneficial to you when you have to come to school, or when you have to do your homework, at, uh, or when you have to learn your lessons, and can you then tell us what you did? Now, what I saw there was like baffling, and that's where I'm coming to my argument now, uh, because I, I'm a strong believer that we need to involve those learners into what we do in EdTech and in how we design our EdTech. Because what I saw was absolutely amazing. So these kids, one of them had designed, two girls had designed a book club for girls, for kids, by kids. Not just a book club like getting Harry Potter and all the, all the kids' books, but actually having a whole ecosystem around that book club that was going to allow kids to write their story, to submit it for curation and editing to the book club run by kids, for kids, and then they were going to publish the story online, on, on the app. So, amazing. And they did that, this is also the point, in 20 minutes. So, that was sort of what I did with the kids in a school that's virtually got nothing, in a school with mega problems, where there's a, a, a huge diversity in terms of those who have and those who haven't. So, rural poverty is quite acute. Um, but, you know, that is what we did. And my argument is when it's all very well as talking about, you know, let's design wonderful EdTech. Let's please, please, please start with them to help us do it. So that's what I wanted to say, because that's where our future is. Yeah. yeah thank you very much. <laughs> Could I please call upon um, Mr. Philip? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I see some faces who were in our session this morning, so I'm going to try to talk about other things uh, in the session. Um, uh, so the, the core question was, uh, is EdTech fulfilling its impact and what is needed to benefit teachers and school systems? And I, I find it quite uh, useful, actually. Audrey Waters is a, a blogger and, and thinker, and she has this great column called The History of the Future of Education Technology. And it goes back to all these uh, inventions of the past that were so exciting at the time and that were going to revolutionize the world. And it's quite, uh, I think, um, useful to go back and remind ourselves of what has come before because especially in EdTech, it always feels like that the next big thing is just around the corner. And it turns out a lot of those ideas have already been around the corner 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And, and um, I got excited about this space because I, I deeply believe in the promise of technology. And I believe that the education challenges that we are facing today cannot be solved without technology, but that technology design embodies pedagogy, and technology itself is never good or bad, but it's always the larger context within which you're designing it and using it. And that's really, the, I think, the space that's most interesting that I care about most. Um, and uh, if I'll just mention one thing that I would point you towards if you're interested, uh, there's a phenomenal Apple uh, video for the Knowledge Navigator. You can find it on YouTube. It was released in 1987, and it is such a phenomenal piece of technology, uh, and it still doesn't exist. We're not even close to what they put in this video uh, then. And so 
Um, I think it's kind of that's the challenge we should set ourselves. It's very human. It's a, a researcher using this uh, artificial intelligence assistant who's very sociable and personal and very helpful, and they're debating with each other. And um, so I think it's kind of we, we should we should not be setting outside um, onto the small incremental problems that we could solve with technology that makes things more efficient. But we should really think kind of what's the broad vision behind a, a, all of this. Um, so. Uh, do I think that EdTech is fulfilling its promise? I don't think so, uh, not yet. Uh, at least I'm committed to the not yet uh, for the rest of my career, I think. Um, so what are some of the reasons? Well, one is um, I think when we talk about education technology, often uh, we don't um, unpack the word education there. A lot of the technology that we work on is really more study technology, right? So you're studying towards some clear defined, clearly defined test or exam, and the technology makes that process a little more efficient or a little uh, better to track for the teacher. So it's really study technology. I don't think it's fully education. And then I also think it makes sense to differentiate between education and learning. I think education technology is often much more about management and the system of education. It's something that uh, my boss, Joey, says education is something that other people do to you, and learning is something that you do for yourself. And so I, I think we should keep that in mind. Is, is the technology really something that enables the individual with other learners to learn and do things that they want to do? Or is it something that makes our system of education uh, more efficient or more predictable or better manageable? Um, so I think that's the one reason. It's like, what are we really talking about when we talk about education technology? And I would argue we should be talk talking about learning technology much more and focusing on that. And then secondly, um, I think there's a big uh, shift in the education technology uh, uh, community um, that uh, kind of mirrors the shift in the web overall. And it's surprisingly, uh, there's a surprisingly large delay uh, in some, some way. So, you know, we had the web 1.0, which was very content focused. And then in 2004, the web 2.0 concept became popular. And it was social, and it was interaction, and it was people talking to each other. Um, and I feel the same way about education technology today. Uh, so far, we've focused very much on content, disseminating content in more efficient ways, or packaging content in, in new ways, and putting content on mobile phones instead of laptops. Um, and we're only just starting to think about the social side of learning and how technology could support that. And I think that's a much more, and Justine and I did a session this morning. We ended up talking about social for almost the entire session. Um, I think social is really the interesting piece. It's connecting learners to each other. It's connecting learners to parents, to mentors, to teachers, to other people to learn with, uh, and those communities that we can form. And at the Media Lab, we've. Uh, we've done a few kind of experiments in that space where um, we've uh, designed an online course and in the kind of in the process called Learning Creative Learning for educators. Um, it's free and, and open. Uh, it's not a MOOC though. And in the in kind of the as the, the course kind of moved along, uh, we started referring to it as a community. And so we wrote a little paper afterwards tinkering with MOOCs where we talk specifically about this idea. It's a community, it's not a course, and how is that different, and how has it changed our experience? And the amazing thing is it's essentially the same set of six weeks of activities, and we've had thousands of people go through this, and many people go through the same set of activities multiple times. So it's not about like, getting it right or mastering this like, amount of content that we've given them. It's really about <laughs> engaging in these activities that we've designed and doing it with other people. And you could do that multiple times, and you're, you continue to learn. Um, I'm not sure how I'm on time. Um, there's, there's a whole range of... Um, so there's a whole range of technologies that I'd love to talk about more, and I'll just basically kind of pin them. So I think there's a lot of interesting stuff around data and AI that lets us uh, draw new insights about how people learn. I think there's a, a lot of interesting stuff in VR and AR and new experiences for learning. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in effective computing. So what's the emotional state that someone is in? And you can use the brain or, or also other ways of tracking that. Um, to see kind of when are people curious and when is the right moment um, for someone to learn something. And then I'll, I'll just end on um, kind of what I, what I started with lar largely, um, which is that uh, technology design always embodies pedagogy. And I, I feel like we don't, as technology designers, we sometimes don't take full responsibility of this or we're not, maybe not thoughtful enough sometimes. Like 
as we uh, design those interfaces through which uh, children or, or parents or teachers interact with each other or interact with content, we are making decisions about the type of education system that we believe should exist. And uh, even though we may uh, not think that the, the technology, we, we, we may think that the technology is just one piece and there's this other stuff, there's really a lot of behavior you can drive through technology design. And so being very thoughtful about that I think is important. And then I'll, last thing I'll say is, Seymour, the Seymour Papert quote that I used this morning, which I still think is kind of the guiding uh, principle for, for EdTech, or should be, is it's about kids programming computers, it's not about computers programming kids. <laughs> Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, that was really interesting. And being a school operator, I kind of resonate with that. You know, technology can definitely help uh, improve uh, educational challenges. However, we cannot forget pedagogy, and that's very, very important. Um, please, can I ask Shankar yeah. to address us? Thank you, Jay. I'll take a different approach. I'll talk more of the uh, promise and perils. Uh, we all know that we are entering a world which is totally unpredictable. It's a VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And, but what do we do know is societies are getting more connected. What we do know is the transactions and interactions between individuals, between communities, between organizations is becoming more and more digital. And this is generating a huge exhaust of data. Right? And data is not just the new oil, data is also the new soil. Data generates more data. So it's a vastly renewable source of energy. And as, it gen as we've created more data in 2017 than in the previous 5,000 years. And what this has done is not only has it given rise to mega platforms that thrive on this data, it has also given rise to automation. And when you come, and Digital also enables unbundling of services. Earlier, you, you, uh, you would buy a car or rent a car, but now you just uh, are hiring that car and the driver for a specific Uber ride. So we are seeing the generation of microservices. When microservices combines with automation, you get not millions of jobs, but tens of millions of work packets. So individuals come together do a particular part of the work, and then they go away. This is if the AI and the robots and the automation still has jobs for them. So automation is incubated, and these microtransactions are leading to the rise of the mega platforms. We had the first generation of uh, platforms, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons. Now we're seeing the second generation of platforms, the Airbnbs, TaskRabbits, uh, and the other gig economies. And what they're doing is they're shifting the focus of the economies from a global manufacturing to a local service-oriented, to a local gig-oriented economy. Now, what's the implication of this? So the first headline I would like to leave with you is micro is the new mega trend. The next big mega trend is everything is going micro, jobs will go micro. And if uh, jobs go micro, can learning be far behind? So we think that not only will learning be micro, learning will be a lifelong journey. As opposed to the current stage of learning being a rite of passage. Uh, you learn and then you earn and then you retire. The future will be about learning, earning, learning, earning cycles of that, right? You're a lifelong continuous learner and earner. Uh, the next generation may not have the luxury of retiring. Uh, as learning goes micro, what is important is not what you learnt or how you learnt. What is important is how you can apply what you have learnt. This is a quote from Tom Friedman. Any of you remember Matrix where uh, Tree downloads a program on how to learn a helicopter, on how to fly a helicopter, and before you know it, she's flying a helicopter, right? We're going to see not something that cool, but something close, an Airbnb host who wants to brush up on soft skills will quickly take a course on soft skills and get certified. Uh, somebody who wants to uh, learn more about a, a particular uh, city will quickly do that because she can offer guide services around an Airbnb experience. So we're gonna be seeing a lot of just-in-time expertise. 
and everybody will script their own unique journeys. Uh, anytime, anywhere, learning, anyhow, on any topic. What this means is that learning will disseminate beyond the current iceberg for your courses, etc. You'll have way more learners, way more kind of uh, uh, courses for them to learn. And uh, the next thing is, not only will great teachers find a great audience, thanks to uh, Google, you'll have a lot more great teachers. Credentialing which is very important. You, you complete schooling, you get a certificate. You complete courses, you complete a university course, you get a degree. Credentialing will be micro. Credentialing will be data-driven. And what that means is the work of a person will be the resume. Because if you look fast forward to 2030, a lot of the jobs in 2030 have not yet been invented. Our schools and universities cannot teach for a job that does not exist. But just like working in Google is a great resume value, there will be new companies that will teach people new skills and those will also be micro-credentials, not just uh, university degrees. And therefore, university degree, universities likely will be platforms to increase their reach. In effect, we might be seeing the third mass revolution in education. First mass revolution, was universal education 19th century. Second mass revolution was higher education, mass higher education post World War II. The third mass revolution might be mass micro learning. The good news is technology, what we already have, can and will enable this, right? Technology is way ahead of our, you know, what the needs for micro learning are. The problem is when and how will society catch up? And therein lies the promise and peril. We have seen with Facebook and the recent elections some of the perils of technology racing ahead of society's ability to uh, mediate and moderate the impact of technology and to create the policies, the content, and the surrounding physical, digital, intellectual, and social infrastructure to manage that technology. Because technology is raced ahead of humans' ability to adapt, as we discussed yesterday. 20 years ago, there were no smartphones. Maybe 10 years later, they will not be smartphones. <clears throat> Humans will always have to struggle to catch up with technology. As a society, how we want to use that will determine whether technology is beneficial or harmful. Is technology more of a promise or is it more of a peril? And at all that, we cannot blame technology, because technology has its own life. It will push its own frontiers, whether we like it or not. Uh, it could be a scary thought, but I think it's a realistic thought. And so I'll again conclude with those three things. Number one, micro is the new mega. Everything is headed in that direction. Number two, learning will be micro. And we're possibly looking at the third mass revolution of uh, micro learning. And fourth, the frontiers of technology will be determined by society's ability to manage technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shankar. <laughs> Hannah, please may I ask you to address the audience. And can I have my presentation, please? OK, thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I was preparing for uh, our speech today, uh, I found this picture, which is a 19th century picture, and uh, in it, the artist tried to predict what the schools would look like in the 21st century. Fortunately, the artist was wrong, because as we see uh, the advance of technology, educational technology nowadays, it is much more than just merely passing on the information from books or other sources into uh, students' heads. It is about uh, stimulating creativity, motivating students to inquire. Can we move to the next slide, please? Oh, there is a clicker. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me, uh... <laughs> where is it? Okay. So I can just go on speaking without uh, if there is no connection. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one. This one. Uh, for me, uh, the truly, uh, there is still not the right view, yes? 
you will fix it. Okay. Uh, a good example of a truly innovative learning uh, environment, which is a technology enhancing environment, is uh, a future classroom lab, which is the initiative of European SchoolNet in Brussels. And uh, uh, what makes it so innovative is not the technology that you can see there, but the way this technology can be used. Because uh, in this uh, future classroom lab, uh, you can see different learning spaces which meet the needs of all the students and which support different learning styles. For example, in the investigate uh, learning zone, children become active learners. They, uh, with the help of technology, they make discoveries themselves. Uh, in the create zone, children use technology to create something. They use technology to develop uh, their soft skills through project-based learning, through teamwork. Uh, in the present zone, students uh, use technology to try to learn how to address different types of audiences, both face-to-face -face and online, through websites, blogging, uh, podcasts. In the interact zone, the teacher uses technology to promote interactivity among uh, students in the classroom. In the exchange zone, uh, children learn to collaborate. And you know that nowadays, uh, the ability to collaborate, the skill to collaborate successfully with others is one, uh, seen as one of the uh, key 21st century skills. Uh, in the develop zone, uh, the teacher uses technology in order to provide personalized learning approaches. Such learning environments already exist in uh, different countries. There are a lot of schools which have uh, lots of equipment, modern equipment, but truly uh, transformational use of technology, creative use of technology by educators is still not a common thing. Teachers need to be trained how to use uh, the limited resources they have uh, to provide really uh, innovative learning environment which will uh, support all the students and meet different learning needs of different types of students. Can we move on? Oh, yes, we can. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, so as I see it also, the technology of the future, educational technology, should boost creativity. And this is just one example from my school. Uh, Children, with the help of technology, need to be able to combine the knowledge that they get at different academic subjects. For example, kids learned a novel at their lesson of literature where the main character crossed the sea by boat. It's a fiction. They don't know what, they bo what that boat looked like. So they imagined the boat and printed the boat on a 3D printer. And that is actually what happened in our school, in our class. And the 3D printer is not... a uh, just bought or received somewhere. It was assembled by one of our teachers, just uh, from the details that he had. Uh, also, I think that um, technology of the future should provide uh, opportunities of collaborative learning experiences. And here I'm talking about such platforms like Penpel Schools, for example, that has already connected uh, about a quarter of a million students from 150 classrooms through uh, online curriculum. And uh, by studying that curriculum, students uh, learn both uh, digital skills, uh, they learn to be uh, digital citizens and uh, uh, respect the opinions of the others. And they also learn soft skills and such skills as empathy uh, and uh, the ability to understand people with different uh, cultures, different beliefs, different religions. Uh, so, in such a way, uh, they are better prepared for the future, what we are talking here about. Uh, another thing is uh, empowering children uh, to make real changes, because students nowadays, children nowadays, they don't want to be passive. They want to be active change makers, and they need tools, digital tools as well, in order to uh, make it possible to change the world. Uh, I'm talking about such tools like, uh, for example, Map Your World Network. And this is a digital network which uh, empowers children to explore uh, issues that really matter, uh, like clean drinking water, uh, food justice, uh, equal education for everybody. Uh, after exploring these uh, issues, children use uh, tools like, uh, for example, smartphones or tablets and special software to analyze the data uh, and to start a campaign then, a campaign for real change, for change in their community. And there are a lot of examples uh, of successful campaigns. 
Uh, also, as we prepare our uh, students for the next, uh, our generation for their future, we uh, cannot uh, stop thinking about developing global competence. And uh, uh, developing global competence is, uh, would be impossible without the uh, ability to connect classrooms from different parts of the world. And such programs as Generation Global, for example, or Mystery Skype, help us to do this. And we need more platforms like this. Uh, because, uh, for example, if children participate in such programs as Generation Global, they do not just talk to each other over uh, video conferences. They engage into serious dialogues, dialogues about issues that really matter. And uh, uh, they uh, tend to understand each other better. Uh, if you have a look at this map, uh, the country in the middle from which all the arrows are going is my country, my home country, Ukraine. And uh, the arrows are pointing to all the countries uh, to which we connected our students in just two years' time. Uh, and uh, you can see the topics that the students discussed uh, with the help of video conferencing. Uh, the topics such as human rights, women's rights, uh, diversity, uh, topics like charity, for example, or uh, such interesting topics as expressing beauty through uh, art and architecture in different cultures and religions. So you can see that uh, children need uh, more, uh, more digital tools to be able to uh, discuss such issues. But also I would like to say that as we speak about the benefits of using digital tools and technology, we should not forget about uh, children who are situated in uh, places, who live and uh, study in places where the access to broadband internet connection is limited or maybe absent in general. Uh, because such kids uh, tend to be left out of the process. So they uh, are staying just outside of this global dial uh, dialogue. And also, we should not forget that uh, technology, educational technology, should be accessible to children with special learning needs. And let me just give you one example. Out of a great number of Skype sessions and Google Hangouts that we had uh, with my kids connecting them to different classrooms in the world, one session definitely stands out. Uh, three classes were connected. A class from Ukraine, a class from the United Kingdom, and a very special class of hearing impaired children from Russia. And those kids, uh, they uh, overcoming all the difficulties that they had, they joined the global dialogue. And they even, uh, with the help of Skype, with the help of technology, sang a Christmas song to us, to other participants of the uh, Skype conference, uh, through the sign language. And with the help of this, uh, Skype session, my students on that day learned a very important lesson, that if you really want your voice to be heard, even the absence of voice cannot stop you. And I would like to finish my speech with this picture, which was taken here at GESF last year. People in it are uh, top 50s from the previous years. They are all teachers. And with the help of this picture, I want to tell you that Behind every piece of educational technology, there is a teacher passionate about what he or she is doing and doing all the best to help their uh, children thrive in this diverse and very rapidly changing world. Thank you. Hannah, thank you very much. I think your examples were quite uh, wonderful, actually. And I think that global connectivity, I think, is really key especially for children, and, and having that understanding is just very, very powerful from, diff, uh, from children from different parts of the world, different cultures, different ethnicities, and understanding that perspective from a different point of view and using technology in that aspect is really, really powerful. So well done. Um, could I please ask Rania? Thank you. Uh, so let me just start by saying it's actually, it's an honor to be amongst uh, such distinguished panelists. Um, so I look after Google for Education for the Middle East and North Africa, and when I started to reflect on this topic, I started to think about my own experience. Um, I grew up in the Silicon Valley where technology is, is abundant. Um, but then I started to think about, well, technology is there, but what does that mean in terms of the skills that we're developing? 
And I think that's actually a question that Google really thinks about a lot um, as we develop our own technology and as we think about what it is that's next for, uh, for the, the services and the tools that we provide. Um, so what we did actually is we, we commissioned a piece of research with the Economist Intelligence Unit um, to understand the elements that need to be in place to adequately prepare students for uh, the world of tomorrow. And I think it's, it's um, we're at a stage right now where we really can't decouple, right? There's, there's the technology that we have in education, but the ultimate goal of actually building the skills in the students uh, for the jobs of tomorrow that, you know, that, that don't necessarily exist today. And so um, that piece of research um, looked at, um, so there was a literature review, there were in-person uh, interviews, there were surveys, and a few key findings actually stood out. So, so naturally, as you would imagine, for teachers to have the autonomy to decide what they want to do within the classroom uh, is a key component in ensuring that 21st century skills are actually implemented or, or supported or developed uh, in a school. Um, but technology actually also stood out as a very key factor in making sure that students have what they need in order to develop those skills. And I think that goes back to, again, teacher autonomy and also autonomy with students as well. Um, so I have some details about the research and uh, I'll just share sort of a few kind of bullet points around it. Um, the majority of educators were in agreement that it is crucial for teachers to, to consider 21st century skills not as the only thing needed to develop students, but as one component in developing a full sort of individual. Um, a range of teaching strategies are also really, really crucial and necessary. Um, and then technology and things like budget are, can be enabling and can be constraining as well. Um, but around teacher autonomy, some of the sort of teaching strategies that were really proven to be the most effective in developing modern workplace skills um, aligned with, um, with a couple of different areas. So things like active learning or project-based learning, uh, cognitive activation and personalized learning. Um, and ultimately, you know, we've, we've sort of taken this, this information and thought about what does that mean in terms of the, the tools and the products and the services that Google provides uh, for schools specifically. Uh, just one more data point that I wanted to share is that the majority of educators uh, who were participating in that piece of research realized that they wanted to adopt some, some form of new technology. Um, but actually getting to that stage or deciding on how quickly to move, there was a lot of discrepancy around that. So some felt that really strongly that it was necessary to move very quickly and others were much more hesitant to, do, to make that change. Um, but one thing that really remains for us at Google, uh, a question that, that's sort of uh, you know, at the heart of what we do is, what should the role of technology play uh, to enable the transformation, ultimately the develop, development of those skills? Um, so whether it's to improve learning outcomes, uh, whether it is um, to, to just build generally 21st century skills, we've kind of looked at the technology that's in place, um, but really built out a set of learning principles that are, uh, that are crucial when implementing that, that technology. So things like making sure that the experience is personalized and that it's measured. Um, you know, stu students have diverse needs, they have diverse learning styles, and therefore technology should be adaptable to that and should cater to the individual. Um, it should be, the second principle is that it should be collaborative and diverse. And ultimately that we need to instill um, collaborative skills, right? That's something that's coming up more and more often as both as we discuss 21st century skills, but just what's needed for um, surviving in, in, uh, in today's world and tomorrow's world, really. Um, the third principle is that it should really be project-based and self-managed. And uh, when, you, when you apply sort of real life learning to, to scenarios within a classroom, it really helps to set things in much deeper and um, allows students to really grasp a concept much more quickly. Um, and I think finally, the last principle is that it, you know, the technology should really enable a conceptual and experiential um, uh, activity. And so it's more important for students to actually grapple with um, and develop certain concepts and under get a deep understanding versus just measuring facts. And uh, you know, we often like to say at, at Google, if you're asking the questions that Google can answer within the classroom, you're probably actually asking the wrong questions. 
Um, so how does Google design technology for schools, whether the, 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 the services or the tools or the, the technology, the platform that we provide is all based on the concept of collaboration and that we should make it very simple for students to really learn anytime, anywhere, and ultimately on any budget. So um, Google provides sort of a couple of different components in education. We provide, we, we run programs for students. We look at uh, ways to develop their, or to pique their interest in, in STEM and STEAM subjects. So things around computer science, um, coding courses, or, um, or uh, competitions. Uh, we also do a number of partnerships with other organizations who are looking at these, these types of questions and how can we really enable them um, and further their goals. And then finally, it's the, the products that we actually develop. So the things like our, our Chromebook um, device, which is you know, a web-based uh, platform or an operating system that's cloud-based. So it really allows for a lot of flexibility in terms of how you, um, how you use the device and how you manage the device. But ultimately, what sits on top of that is a, a, a suite of tools called G Suite for Education. And that's really fundamentally built on a concept of collaboration, that students work better when they work together, teachers and students work better when they're able to collaborate in an easy to use platform. Um, so there are a number of principles and uh, considerations that we look at when developing what we do at, at Google. Um, I think starting from that very, very top level uh, point of how do, we, how do we empower students? How do we use these products or design them in a way that helps them to build the, the, the skills that they need for, for the jobs of tomorrow and, um, and ultimately the world of tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you. Funny, I think your point on experiential learning is, uh, is really, really cool. Um, I think a lot of kids nowadays, I think they focus a lot on just the exams and stuff, and it'd be great to give them a new sight of, you know, experiencing the learning in a really practical way so you can really see true examples of what it actually is to learn this concept or topic and stuff. Okay. And we see a lot of that uh, going forward. That's wonderful. Um, can I please call upon Justine? Thank you. I kind of feel like we're a bunch of snake oil salesmen, that we're sitting up here saying, buy this, this will make you happy, this will make you feel better, and it's all going to be okay. But I'm not sure it's going to be okay. I think it depends on us. And I wanna show a vision here that could be a dystopia or a utopia and talk about what's going to lead us to the dystopia and what's going to lead us to the utopia. In 1994, British Telecom asked me to fly to Australia and meet with the CEOs of many major companies and talk to them about the internet. This was 94. And the questions I got were, oh, thank goodness you're here. I have been worrying about whether I need to fire everybody under the age of 20 in my company. Is my secretary going to be able to learn how to use this thing? And he or she did, <laughs> undoubtedly. And it's very hard for me to get a grasp on what you're talking about because no one seems able to tell me who owns the internet. And these questions seem silly to us today, but they didn't seem silly to us always. And every time a new technology has been invented, there have been two paths in front of us, a utopia and a dystopia. A very long time ago, the director of a monastery wrote that the printing press was destroying religion because when monks did not engage manually with the parchment on which they wrote their documents, they would no longer truly feel inside their connection with God. And we might find that funny today. A mother wrote into a newspaper and said, my children have murder on the mind, and I know it's those things, I know it is. And that was 1942 when she was talking about the radio. The same thing in 1967. The US government published a guide for parents. And it said, 
Above all, remember that machines are bad babysitters. Love your child. And that needed to be said out loud. And today, we once again ask whether machines are babysitting our children and whether we've remembered that loving our children is probably the most important thing. So what does this all have to do with today's technologies and the frontiers that we're moving towards? I don't think in this panel we've really talked about what we mean by technology. Because of course, this is an excellent teaching tool. It also, in some of the schools I've worked in, has been used to stab people, me <laughs> among others. And is that the technology? Should we remove pens from all classrooms? What about books? How many of you have ever seen a book flung to the floor? Actual question. How about a book flung at the head of another child? Your classrooms are so much better behaved than mine. Is that actually true? How did I end up in the classrooms I ended up in? So what I mean by this is, and I always wonder, every time I go into a plane, you know, and we're not allowed to, to take a knife, I always wonder about the pen. I always wonder why the pens aren't removed from us, because they're at least as sharp as knives. So, I'm showing you a picture of a technology that's maybe a little bit radical because it has three children playing together. And one of them is alive and the other two are cartoons. But the three of them are collaborating. The child who is alive, who is a real child, has been diagnosed with Asperger's or high functioning autism. And the research in my lab has shown better than it, the state of the art today, children are able to use social skills better with virtual children. That, to me, is a dystopia. I don't want any child to be consigned to a life of only interacting with cartoon characters. And so in my lab, we took the next step, sometimes called the holy grail for researchers. Did that affect transfer when we brought those children back into their classrooms with real children? And we were happy to find that when interacting with real children, those children with Asperger's who had learned their social skills from virtual children were better able to socialize with real children. And I can give you details about that if you want. So why all these cautionary tales? because I think we really are faced with two paths. If any school superintendent decides that teachers are too expensive and that training teachers is simply a waste of money because we can get the young ones cheaper, and besides which there are robots that can take their place, or videos that we can put on and have one teacher to manage 10 classrooms. Because after all, don't we have interactive tutoring systems and MOOCs that we can put in the teacher's place? Then we really have created a nightmare. But if every teacher stands up and appropriates technology for him or herself and makes it into a tool that can only work with a teacher. Actually, I'm more scared that we're going to replace the children because they're so much better behaved when they're virtual. <laughs> a virtual child has never stabbed me with a pen, not once, or thrown a book at anybody's head. These guys don't actually have legs. At the table, they stop. And so they can't move far enough to throw a book at anyone. But back to the teachers. So if, if we appropriate technology in our classrooms, if we only, as superintendents of schools, purchase technology that helps to train teachers in continuing education to become better at their craft, if we continue or maybe if we start to pay our teachers a living wage and invite them to collaborate with us 
on building technologies that work for their particular educational context and the particular children they teach. Then we're on the road to a utopia. Tools like this, people tell me they're worried that the children have forgotten what a real child looks like, that we've destroyed them. Sherry Turkle is one of these people, a famous researcher at uh, MIT, who says that these tools destroy children's sense of what it means to be a real person. On the contrary, what we find is that they can build empathy and a sense of what it means to be human and what we care most about which is the relationships between us and others. So rather than talking about particular technologies, which I can do for days on end, I want to talk about the fact that you can't let it overtake you. You can't sit back and say, you're the technologist. What do I have to do to make this thing work? I've uh, been lucky enough to go to Davos for seven years now, and every year I get asked the same question about work. Are robots going to take over jobs? Well, that kind of depends on you, doesn't it? If you're a factory owner and you decide it's cheaper to use robots, why then, yes, it is. That's going to be the case. But if you say we can do a better job, and if you work with technologists to demonstrate the ways in which technology can collaborate, then you've built a school system, an ecosystem, and a future nation of young people that we all want to see, that all of us want to have our children become. Young people who want to collaborate with their peers, who use technology as an infrastructure on which to build their learning. And we're discovering in my lab increasingly, as Philip mentioned, that the social interaction between children, between peers, or as Vygotsky told us, between children and children one step older, acts as an essential infrastructure to learning. And in many classrooms where we don't have the leisure to sit with every group of children, technology can play an important role to teach children how to cooperate and to collaborate. So I guess I'm saying, don't let technology tell you what to do. Don't be a listener. When I first arrived at MIT, a very famous large company came to see me and they said, we are the storytelling company of the world and we've heard that you're building storytelling systems. But we're the storytelling company of the world, and so we want to see what you're building. And I said, I don't build storytelling systems. I build story listening systems. Children don't need storytellers. They need story listeners, because when they go home, their parents have their noses buried in cell phones. And when they go out, they see people surrounded by a wall that's made by conversations had with those who are distant. Who's listening to them? You are listening to them. You are an essential brick in the structure that's going to support them as they grow older and healthy, psychically, mentally, physically healthy. So don't listen to technology. Listen to children. Bring children into the process of appropriating technology in your classroom. And make it happen the way you want it to happen. Don't let someone say to you, these are the perils. These are the promises. I've got some snake oil to sell you. Make it happen. I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Justine. I'm a big advocate of that. We can't alienate our stakeholders, and we need to bring them along the journey um, to where technology is going. And that's, I think that's very, very important. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left, and I just want to open out to the floor for any questions for our, for our five speakers. And um, I think there's a mic on either end. The gentleman in the front, the second row. Uh, first off, thank you so much, guys. Great session. 
I think I'll take uh, things that three speakers men uh, mentioned and tied them into a question if possible. So Halaf, you first mentioned uh, that the teacher, I mean, behind every ed tech there has to be a teacher. There is. You mentioned, Justine, that uh, the teacher needs to appropriate technology. And to kind of count, uh, as a counterpoint to that, Shankar, you mentioned that technology is rushing ahead of civilization as we catch up. So what I'm thinking is, now we've been working, uh, by the, my name is Joel, I work with Zaya Learning Labs. I, uh, so we've been working with teachers and helping them adopt technology for some time. We find children are very good at ado adopting technology, that's never been a problem. But getting teachers, especially first generation learner teachers, let alone first generation tech learner teachers, has been a very, very large uh, gap to fill. And that's why we're looking at, you know, where we might be able to make the difference. But I'd love uh, from your points of view, from this for the entire panel, including you, Jay, uh, what could we possibly do to help teachers bridge that emotional journey? I mean, if, if you have specific ideas, that'd be wonderful. Um, from our own perspective, from running and operating schools, I think one of the things I said just, just early after Justine's um, uh, comments was that, I think bringing, if you do want to teachers, I think that's when you lose them. And you need to bring them along the journey. You need to explain to them why we're doing this, why technology is going to be, can be supportive and a tool for you guys to be more impactful from a classroom perspective. And in the past, when we were, you know, um, uh, schools were growing in different parts of the world, you could never just imp input what you thought was appropriate for the school without bringing them on the journey, and you kind of lost them. It's there, but they never use it. And that's kind of the worst thing possible, correct? And once you bring them on the journey and bring them on that whole path, we've had much more success. And these could be simple things. It could be like just back-end platforms or something like that, but that's when we found success. Bring them in through the journey, and then we had phenomenal adoption. They started to understand what the benefits were, and rather than being so scared of it, and so on and so forth. But I would love to pass it on to the... Okay. Uh, since you asked some specific examples, uh, let me walk you through what's happening in India now. So, as Justine said, there's a 500-year-old technology called the printing press, which churns out textbooks. And there is a 60-year-old technology called the television, through which we're used to watching videos. So, uh, in India, uh, six states have started printing textbooks, which have QR codes. Uh, one for every chapter, such that when a teacher opens up a, a government app, scans the QR code, it opens up content on how to teach those topics better. This is meant for government schools, which are low budget kind of things. And a lot of teachers in India, because government salaries are good, have a smartphone. And they are interacting with each other through WhatsApp to understand how to teach difficult topics. So a one degree separation from what you're used to means that you, can, you have a smartphone, you can take a photograph, you're used to a textbook. So taking a photograph of a QR code opens up videos on how to teach that particular topic curated by the state's experts. So the existing system is using technology to do what would otherwise take lots of teacher training at a point which is just in time, when the teacher wants to teach that topic. So that's one example. Another example, which is the other extreme, which is technology-led, is figuring out through AR, VR, explaining to the teacher how to teach, spending a lot of money, not realizing that it is maybe taking away the agency of the teacher. So completely second what Justine said that It has to start with what do we want as society, right? What do we understand where the teacher is? Are we threatening the teacher? And then, in this case, there was collaboration between not-for-profits, governments, technology companies to come up with this solution which now the national government is scaling up across the country. So that's one example of a human-led uh, innovation. And I can just give an example uh, how we tried to influence teachers in our region to be more willing to use technology that we are using. Uh, we invited them to uh, a master class and connected uh, to, uh, to other teachers, uh, to other classes via Skype, while uh, our teachers from the region were present in our school and they just saw uh, how excited the kids were and uh, all the benefits that they got uh, out of this conversation, video conversation. So by giving uh, examples from teachers to teachers, uh, because teachers will listen teachers more willingly and uh, they will be uh, more eager to adopt what others are doing. Yeah, I also think we really need to think about how we educate teachers because we kind of still in most teacher education don't address the development of digital acumen 
I'm not talking here about how to use a computer or how to you know, use a PowerPoint or teach your kids how to <coughs> use PowerPoint. I'm actually t t talking beyond this. It's about a whole kind of mindset around digital acumen and how that applies in your teaching. Because we're all consumers of technology, but, and I spoke about this yesterday as well, but the minute we come into a learning environment, it applies as much to the learners, I'm sure Justine will corroborate that, as it does to the teachers. The way we work with technology or interact with technology will be very, very different to the behavior we have as the technology consumers. Mm -hmm. And so what we're expecting from our teachers is like, oh, well, they're, they're cons consumers of technology, so surely they can do this in the classroom. No, this is about a development of digital mindset and digital acumen and pedagogy and integration of the technology in all those things. And if we don't start doing that in teacher education before the teacher hits the classroom, we will have the same conversation in five years' time, in 10 years' time, in 15 years' time. And then we are actually disservicing not only the teacher, but you know, it's then we're losing the promise altogether because we're disservicing the, the kids I was talking about in my little school. Um, and so that is, I think, where we need to look next, is how do we work with the teacher educators to kind of develop that acumen? I want to move even further back in the chain. Um, any technology that's developed in a lab and has not been road tested before being put in the box is not going to work in a classroom. Because you have curricula. We have, as teachers, curricula that we need to adhere to, that we want to adhere to, that we built. And a technology that, that lands on our desk, use this, it'll improve your teaching. But it doesn't have anything to do with what we do on a daily basis, is going to do us no good. So in my lab with my students, for example, everything that gets tested in the lab then gets tested in the classroom, then gets worked through with teachers so that it fits into a particular curriculum. And that means not that it's necessarily easy to use, but that it's meaningful, which makes it easier to use. Any other questions? The lady at the back. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I'm losing my voice. Sophie Edwards from DevEx. Um, I had a question for you, Shankar. Could you just say a bit more about what you meant about the future being micro? Um, yeah. So uh, we now have, uh, in terms of jobs, right? Earlier used to employ somebody for a career. Then you employed them for an assignment, right? Now, uh, as jobs are breaking up into smaller pieces because of what I mentioned being digital, you don't have to uh, hire somebody for a whole month. You could just hire somebody for a specific job, right? And then after the job is over, uh, you both go your own ways. Uber is a classic example of that, right? Uh, Airbnb, TaskRabbit. So as, as jobs are going to go more micro, and uh, because of uh, AI and all the advances in technology, there will be new jobs that will come which have not been discovered. A lot of them Whatever can be automated will be automated. So uh, think of work breaking up into millions of small, small work packets. And different people will be brought in to, with specific skills to do that particular job. And large scale platforms will aggregate that together like the way you have the second generation platforms. That will result in learning also going micro and learning going uh, lifelong. Can I chime in here? Of course, yeah, of course. Sounds, like you of course. didn't ask me, but um, uh, it reminds me of something that I just kind of an impression I've had as I've listened to all of us talk here. It's uh, and maybe it's it's like the afternoon on the second day, everyone's a little tired, but like it feels a little bit like we're kind of a downer panel on education <laughs> technology. Um, and so I try to remember like why am I so excited about this space? And I am excited. And I think maybe it's because the world is changing so interestingly right now outside of schools and outside of universities and like trying to understand what's happening out there and how are people learning and then how can we change the institutions. I think that's maybe the, the, the one of the sources of excitement. And one of my favorite um, uh, kind of examples is always, I ask people, uh, what is the last thing you've learned on YouTube? 
And it's amazing what you hear from people. I mean, like, so just, you know, personal stories. My friend Tao learned to ride a bicycle on YouTube when he was in his late 30s. Uh, there's a guy who learned how to javelin throw from YouTube who then competed at the Olympics and won a, a bronze or silver medal. Uh, there's a family whose house got destroyed in a storm who then learned on YouTube how to rebuild their house. And um, I'm actually a little bit worried about the data implications of using YouTube for everything. So I'm not like, I'm not an evangelist of like, let's do everything on YouTube. But it's amazing to me, like there's all this learning that's happening that has nothing to do with schools or universities. And we're kind of, we're so stuck in, like education has to happen in this particular way. And it gets hard. And then how do we train the teachers? And how do you make sure everyone is on board? And it's like, sure, all of those things are important. But there's also just this like joy of learning. And there are all these opportunities these days that exist that people are taking advantage of that didn't exist 10 years ago even. So I think we want to, you know, we want to keep some of that excitement, I think, and then bring that in the, into the institutions and make sure everyone can, can use those materials and, and education can change. But I, I don't know, I just had the impression that we're kind of, like, I, I was kind of convinced after listening to all of us that maybe I shouldn't be doing ed tech or uh, so. <laughs> that wasn't my intent. Maybe you shouldn't be doing it the way you're doing it, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> um, any more questions? Any more questions? No? Well, just one though then. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, the gentleman in the back corner on the right. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Um, I teach problem solving and project management at university through social challenges. So my students work with social organizations to work on a challenge. When it, I had been seven years abroad, so I have to readjust to my own Portuguese culture. And one of my challenges has been, how do I teach deep critical thinking in a fast-changing world for students, for a generation that grew up glued on Facebook and are exam dependent? So how do you, in spite of technology, make them manage it well and be able to also take a step back and know when to use technology and when to just focus because it's, I don't know if I was clear on my question. So technology as an enabler, but then again, also being, teaching them how to critically think, deep thinking and focus. Anyone? Great question. Can I take a step? My students and I have been looking at curiosity um, and it's been really, really fun. Right now we're looking at uh, 12, 13 year olds and it's not something that I ever really thought about. I mean, I was kind of a curious kid. I took things apart, and I know other people who took things apart, and I just wanted to know how they worked, and I kind of took this for granted. And it wasn't until I started working in classrooms and saw the routine slaying of curiosity thanks to a teach-to-the-test environment that's becoming more and more universal that I decided that, that we needed to do something. In the US, and I know less about um, other countries, although certainly know a number of other countries where this is also true, schools actually get funding as a function of how well their students do on tests. And that's pretty much a good incentive for teaching students to pass tests. But passing tests, while it's a really good skill, like maybe they could take their driver's ed class and learn how to pass that. Lots of good skills there. It's not learning to learn, which is what life learn, lifelong learning is going to depend on. Do we want to learn? Are we always going to want to learn? What's going to make us want to learn something? And so we've been tracing that back to the roots of curiosity. And we had this horrible week where we started collecting data in schools and in after school programs and then gave up and brought kids into the lab because, and I've told this example to some of you, because the teacher told the children to divide into groups of four and collaborate and for each of them to take a rock and then she said, okay everybody, smell your rock. Good, now put it down and write what you smelled in your notebook. Great, now touch the rock and the kids are like, oh God. But nevertheless, you know, they have to touch the rock, they touch the rock write down what you touched, and so on and so forth. And 
if there was ever any curiosity about what that rock was, it was gone by the time that assignment was finished in the collaborative work environment. And so what we've been noticing is that we need to get out of the way. That um, yes, Facebook is a way of wasting time. That doesn't mean that it's killed curiosity in children. We may be the murderers sometimes. We don't have to be though. We can bring children together and say, I'm out of here, you know, build this. And I don't know how to do it, I haven't managed, but you're gonna figure it out. And what we're seeing in environments like that is that curiosity is contagious amongst the children or that one kid will challenge another and that'll evoke curiosity in the first kid who will say, I'll show you, uh-uh. And that's what is going to lead to critical thinking and the kinds of skills that you're trying to teach. And it's really simple. In fact, it's gonna to lead to innovation, which is probably part of what you're trying to grow in these um, young people. I don't think Facebook has killed it. I don't think it has, and I don't think we need to kill it. Although, you know, it's kind of in danger from a school system that does teach to the test. So I guess what I'm saying is have faith in your kids that they can, and your adult kids in your class, that they can let go of Facebook and learn to be curious and that curiosity is connected to those critical thinking skills that you're trying to evoke in them. That's, um, sorry to confirm, but that's exactly why I did with the, the kids at my primary school what I did, because that's exactly what didn't happen. You know, we didn't ask them to smell the rock and to kind of touch the rock and to then have a kind of existential uh, <laughs> essay about the rock. We actually asked them, do something together, invent something together, work out a problem, Come, come to us. If you get stuck, it doesn't matter, you know, but just keep trying and come to us with what you want to do. And you know what? None of the kids got stuck. The only problem one had is that he cut his marshmallow in such small pieces he couldn't use it anymore. But that was the only problem we had in the whole challenge. So just, you know, to corroborate what you're saying, it's, it's about, you know, if you give that platform... And the teacher was around, and the teacher was also kind of making sure they were all right, and, you know, and I was around, and, and it wasn't non-teacher-led completely, but it was driven by them. And that, I think, is so important when we talk about the technology as well, that, you know, when we design EdTech, we so often design it either without the teacher or much more often than that without the learner in mind or even the learner involved, and that is where we need to go to make it work for tomorrow. Mm. Yeah. I think on that note, uh, I think another round of applause for our speakers. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the afternoon. Okay, thank you. <laughs>